first, thank you for asking me to present my thoughts. I want to be clear and lower the bar a bit. I am not and will never be a scholar. I am not well read, and I blame that mostly on uh, being a dyslexic, but in my heart I know it's because I'm too lazy to be a scholar, and I lack the discipline that is necessary for a scholar. I did, however, figure out how to play the game of strategy we call education. Uh, and I was able to successfully navigate the American educational system. Now, you've got to remember that successfully there is a relative term. Uh, out of uh, one of the strategies that I picked up while I was uh, going through school, and particularly in college, was I learned to write the paper first and then go find people that said the same kind of thing that I was saying and footnote them as my source. Now, I'm still operating with that kind of plan. Uh, so if anyone else has said anything that I am going to say and would deserve the credit, fine, give it to them. It's not like I read their stuff anyhow. <laughs> so the, there is no disrespect or plagiarism intended or any of that, except maybe towards myself. I copy myself all the time. I come to this paper a little like someone walking to City Hall to warn City Hall about the dangers of an uncontrolled intersection. On the way, he comes to that intersection and finds the aftermath of a T-bone crash. Should he continue to City Hall to warn about the danger? One might think such a warning would be unnecessary given the smoking wreck sitting in the intersection. In our society, our denominations, congregations, families, relationships, we are looking at a steaming wreck. There were signs. There were people who had seen the danger at the intersection. They had warned us, but we ignored them. One such person was C.S. Lewis, who was one of these people. He, in his work, uh, 1944, The Abolition of Man, he so clearly raised the warning about re uh, that reading it is akin to reading today's news. The engineering of the trousered ape. The subtitle is as important as the title because it identifies the vein into which the DNA altering serum was transfused. And that took it directly to the heart of our society. The subtitle of Lewis's book, Abolition of Man, reads, Reflections on Education with Special Reference to the Teaching of English in the Upper Forms of School. This book is based on three lectures that Lewis, Lewis, uh, Lewis delivered in 1943. He raised a warning flag in view of changes being introduced in education which Lewis predicted would have dire consequences if, if they continued to their ultimate end. Lewis used the image of the trousered ape to describe the outcome of this new approach to education. This new pedagogy is designed to take away man's understanding of who they are. It replaces our understanding of humanity with the idea that humans are nothing more than mere animals, just another animal on a branch of the evolutionary tree. The process Lewis identifies dehumanizes us and results in the abolition of man. Watch today's news, and what you see is not simply the activities of sinful human beings, but of humans who see themselves as nothing more than animals. It would appear that Lewis's prediction has come true. We have achieved the abolition of man and have produced animals wearing clothes, trousered apes. How did this happen? 
Was it just the inevitable natural demise of a great society? I think not. This was done to us purposefully. It was engineered. I am not a scholar, as I said, nor a particularly smart man, which most of you can testify to. But throughout my undergraduate work, I knew something was off. Somewhere around 1968, I was diagnosed as a dis with dyslexia, a, a then newly invented, I mean uh, discovered, learning disability. I have uh, I was put into special education classes in 6th, 7th, and 8th grades. I knew the distinction special was not a compliment. Those were the kids on the short bus. But I wasn't stupid, and even though my teachers and tutors' parents kept telling me that I was not stupid, they were treating me like I was, like I needed special help. In 8th grade, the school guidance counselor uh, advised me to pick a trade because I, and this is a quote, was not smart enough to go to college, end quote. Unknowingly, what I was experiencing in school was the very process which Lewis describes in The Abolition of Man, which I didn't read till around 2016. This past February, I retired from the parish ministry and while I was preparing this paper, I was introduced to Dr. Thomas Corcock's book, Serpents in the Classroom, and Battle of the American Mind, or For the American Mind, by Pete uh, Hegseth. I strongly recommend that you read both of these books along with The Abolition of Man. They are dealing with trousered apes, which we deal with in our parishes, schools, families, and it is important that we understand how the trousered ape was engineered and came to be. At the heart of our present dilemma is a denial of reality that affects all issues, subjects, and aspects of present day life. It is a first article issue, and unless we start there, wherever we uh, do, whatever we do is destined to lead us on a course to irrelevancy and failure. In the first article of the Nicene Creed, we confess, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. It may seem odd to start a discussion of Lewis's trousered ape with the first article of the Nicene Creed, but the Creed's declaration is far more than a pre-scientific man's attempt to express his perspective on reality, ignoring, uh, giving uh, exposition to the desire to explain the world which he does not understand. Nor is it evidence of patriarchal dominance over femininity. It is, in fact, a declaration of reality not an opinion, but a statement of first principle. Modern American education rests on the foundation laid by John Dewey and his ilk and others of the emerging progressive movement. As a socialist, he endeavored to, quote, reform American society by resting its foundation on the humanist manifesto, which is um, antithetical, that's the dyslexia coming in, I'll do that occasionally, antithetical to the uh, creed, uh, Creed's first article. The moment he helped establish, uh, the movement he helped establish, has become the standard in society and especially education, in both public and private. The so-called progressive movement then and now seeks to progress society toward a social idea, socialist idea. From the beginning, it stands against the reality which is embodied in the first article of the church's ancient creed. It endeavors to do away with the invisible by redefining it as only that which science has not yet discovered. Lewis 
seeks to describe the content of the invisible from uh, of the creed as a presupposition he calls Tao or Tao, depending where you're from. Uh, he describes Tao as, quote, the reality beyond all predicates, the abyss that was before the creator himself. It is nature. It is the way, the road. It is the way in which the universe goes on, the way in which things everlastingly emerge, stilly and tranquilly into space and time. It is also the way which every man should tr tread in imitation of the cosmic and supercosmic progressions, confor conforming all activities to that great exemplar. It, in ritual, say the analects, and that's not the dialects of the Doctor Who, uh, it is harmony with nature that is prized. The ancient Jews likewise praised the law as being true, end quote. While I, I agree with the Chinese, I do not, I disagree with the Chinese concept of Tao, that is the abyss that was before the creator himself, I understand that Lewis was looking for an efficient word to describe the concept even though Tao is a flawed concept, it is, I think, the best he had. I would suggest the abyss that was before the Creator himself be altered to refer to that which emanates from God. It is not God, but is the perfect expression fully in line with God's nature. I would suggest it is what we call order of creation. I would also suggest that while we are, while we may discover the processes our Creator employs in creation, we are forever unable to see past creation to know God. This knowledge must be revealed to us by God. He has done this through Scripture. Over the decades, I have observed the Lutherans, LCMS in particular, battling against secular humanism and society's slow redefining and destruction of invisible by pushing back against evolutionary theory, social injustice, the sexual revolution, abortion, and the like, by rightly bringing scriptural, scriptural principles to bear on these issues. There has been much great writing and scholarship given to the issues with which society has challenged the church. But in the defenses we, that we marshal, we are treating only the symptoms and not the disease. We have failed to understand that these issues are but straw men being used to advance an unspoken and in many, some cases unconscious agenda. The goal of this agenda is to remove from our society the existence of the invisible. As the church has increasingly engaged society's issues, why is it that our congregations, our families, continue to see the exodus of our children from faith? Why are Christian institutions looking more and more like those of the secular world? Why, in some cases, is the church surpassing the society in a downward death spiral? It is because the goal of this unspoken agenda has largely been met in society and tolerated in the church, and in many cases, even adopted by the visible church. The church has not addressed the means by which Satan is dissolving the connective tissue that the triune God uses in creation to maintain the very structure of creation. Recall the LCMS's painful battle defending the verba of the Bible. Having won that battle, the LCMS has continued to tolerate the secular humanistic approach to the interpretation and application of what God has revealed in his word by maintaining a separation of visible observation and the revealed reality in the word. Even though the 
inerrancy of Scripture was defended, disciplines which are limited to the visible are granted influence and even authority over what God has revealed or the invisible in his word. Theistic evolution, psychology, sociology, educational philosophy, philosophy, uh, geology, jurisprudence, social justice, etc., all lose the tempering and illuminating effect of reality, visible and invisible. The instruct, uh, interpretation and application of a revealed knowledge of God is trumped, and no reference to any political person who may have in mind, uh, by the uncertain subjective will of men. Any thought process which is absence of the influence of the invisible has replaced God's authority with man's subjective limited observation. Today, the trousered ape's observation defines the truth and reality. The fall, in the fall, the death of man included any, or death of man included any possibility of seeing what exists beyond the visible creation. Therefore, the trousered ape's op operating principle is that truth is just your opinion. Reality is determined by the consensus and enforced by those who have the economic and political power to mandate it. Any assertion of truth or reality contrary to the prevailing truth or reality is met with the tyrannical methods of enforcement. Some have said that wokeness is a religion. That gives wokeness too much respect. Wokeness is to reality, that is true faith, what antimatter is to matter. When the two meet, both are destroyed. So there is no God, and human are, humans are animals like any other, except that for now, we still wear pants. From the fall, Satan's strategy of dehumanization was, uh, has not changed. Consider gen the Genesis chapter 3. Most so-called Christian denominations no longer believe or defend Adam and Eve as actual historic figures. Prevailing is the thought that the first three chapters of the Bible do not give an account of creation, but rather are merely a misguided fable, solidifying male dominance over women. There are few denominations that consider the account of the fall as accurate. Confessional Lutherans do. We all understand that Satan tempted Eve by attacking the word and promise, uh, and promise that God had given. Did God really say? Eve's reaction? So then the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eye and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Was the tree good for food? No doubt. It was most likely delicious. Was it a delight to the eye? What in God's creation was not beautiful? Satan himself was created beautiful. Did it make one wise, knowing both good and evil? Yes, it did. But... None of these were germane to Eve's dilemma. What was relevant was that God, when he created, established the principle of perfect order. Man was not to eat this tree. God had revealed this to Adam and Eve. Not eating of this tree was part of God's order of creation. The trousered ape accuses God of wrongdoing because he created the tree in the first place. And the simple fact was that God had created true love, and true love requires the possibility of rejection in order for it to exist. Even the trousered ape knows this 
And that is why it is so great when a three-year-old running through the house pulls a U-turn, jumps on your lap, gives you a hug, and says, I love you. He didn't have to do it. He could have just simply kept going. That is why no matter how long that you keep a woman chained to a pole in your basement, she won't love you. She may say it, but that's coercion, not true love. My, my, I was going to say, my lawyers want to point out, I've never tried that. And my wife's even here. You can ask her. Of course, I mean, never mind. Uh, Satan attacked the reality of, uh, of God's revealed word. He sought to move God's word from the realm of objective reality to subjective opinion. This word of God is not a matter of interpretation because it is the very sinew that orders creation. Replacing the reality of God's word with the thoughts of man conjures up a creation without God. In such a creation, truth, reality, re truth, reality, peace, and love are not understandable. Paul writes in Hebrews, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it men of old receive their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Faith makes the invisible known. Not by seeing it or feeling it, but because God has revealed the invisible in the verba of Holy Scripture. Without this understanding of the invisible, which is out of the reach of human experience by God revealing it, bless you, in his word, more is lost than the intellectual concept of God. All aspects of human life are altered with this understanding. The society of the trousered ape is operating on it an entire, entirely untenable foundation. In time past, we, uh, we were given a gift. When we were given a gift, it was received with appreciation because of the giver. This is what humans do. The one who gi gave it has expressed their love and chosen an object for us, and we appreciated the giver for it. Today, the subhuman trousered ape gives gifts, and when he does, the gifts must be something we wanted. There is no consideration of the one who gave it. Every year, my aunt gave me pajamas for Christmas, and every year the pajamas came up to my armpits. We kids were taught to appreciate it because it came from my aunt, and we appreciated her. In soci the society of trousered apes, gifts come with return receipts or are chosen from an approved list. This subhuman, egocentric mindset distorts our relationships and our government. Without an understanding of the existence of the invisible, we have no ability to learn that which can only be taught by God. We love because he first loved us. Without this understanding, there is no ability to distinguish between the unrevealed knowledge of God and the revealed knowledge of God. By denying the existence of God and the... In, uh, existence of God and the invisible, we are left with only the visible. There is only the animal desire. The trousered ape insists uh, that the trousered ape invests great efforts to discredit those who believe in the invisible. Why the animal attacks what it does not uh, think exists seems odd. If we had a dog that kept attacking uh, thin air, we would say the dog has lost his mind and we'd put him down. But if there is no God, 
Why does the trousered ape care? Why does he demand to know what the, un, the unexistent God is thinking? The trousered ape demands from believers an explanation of what God, who they don't believe in, was thinking when he created, oh, say, the platypus. And when we can't answer, he denies God's existence and condemns him for evil intent. As the trousered ape, we ignorantly have no desire to hear what God wants to reveal to us. After all, our opinions are as good as his. Satan has dissolved the sinew that connects, connects us to God, to God's revelation in his word, and to the order of creation. When Christians adopt the current pedagogy of education and seek to educate our people with Jesus scotch tape to the curriculum, we are destined to get nowhere except where the trousered ape intends us to go, and that is an existence where there is no God. Today, when Christians seek to defend theistic creation using only the visible means, we come up with concepts like the intelligent design. We like to think we're pretty smart, arguing for invisible God and his creative power using only what is seen. Consider the honeybee. We all know honeybees fly, but with our understanding of aerodynamics, they should not. Christians answer using revealed knowledge. God said he would, they should. Drop mic, we win the argument, we think. We think we have them. We see there is, see, there is a God. See how shallow these big bang evolutionists are? Well, then, con then computers and cameras were developed that were fast enough to record around 2,000 frames per second, which allowed scientists to slow down the movement of the honeybee's wings enough that they were able to see the J stroke of the wing and uh, that gives extra lift. Scientists also observed that bees were, had, can change the surface area of their wings with this additional understanding, the facts that honeybees fly is no longer a mystery requiring divine intervention. That which was invisible has become visible. The trousered ape is assured there is no God. Here is a secular humanist response to this discovery. The writer texts, Researchers at Caltech have discovered how honeybees fly. Put one, puts one more nail in the coffin of intelligent design. From, from the article, people in the intelligent design community have said that we are not even, uh, we don't even know how bees fly, dot, dot, dot. We were finally able to put this one to rest. We do have the tools to understand bees' flight and we can use science to understand the world around us. <coughs> proving, the, proving the invisible, I'm going for vodka. Proving the invisible by the visible will not work. Lewis addresses man's desire to control creation through science through scientific research. In the revealed knowledge of God, he told us to subdue creation. So there's nothing wrong with man splitting the atom or using our understanding of fluid dynamics and aerodynamics to develop more efficient planes. The problem is, in our fallen state, we can no longer distinguish what is good and what is evil. And our default position is evil. The only standard is, is our preference at the moment. When we, can, when we come to understand a process God is using in, visible, in the visible world, we think we, are, we have moved something from the invisible to the visible. Science, uh, 
seeks to show us that everything is nothing more than visible. The invisible is merely the realm of what we cannot explain yet. What is will be shown by man's understanding given enough time or money. Lewis points out that, there, that when something is explained by visible means, it loses its mystery and the divine connection. Even though science cannot explain things like gravity, what it is, how humans know they exist, what light really is. Is it a wave or is it a particle? And if it's a particle, how can it act like a wave? For scientists who deny the invisible, the answer cannot be the existence of an invisible command from the almighty creator making it so. Science cannot explain self-awareness. One day, we may be able to find the mechanisms that make self-awareness possible. And if we do, we will see a real advancement in artificial intelligence. When Elon Musk was interviewed by Babylon Bee, he raised a bit of a concern about AI. If we create computers that have self-awareness, can't they continue to evolve on their own? There, there is one way to predict uh, there is no way to predict that they will come up with and how they will treat us. But we still will not have the answer why humans have self-awareness and animals do not. Others have uh, other than chance. Any uh, process or progress we have made toward the answer was primarily made by dumbing down what is meant by self-awareness. To illustrate this point, con <laughs> now that's funny. Uh, oh, it's Hungana. I was hoping it was my daughter. She called twice during sermons. Uh, to illustrate this, this point, eh. consider our genetic cousins, chimpanzees. Like humans, they use tools. A piece of straw is used as a tool to get ants out of a log. This implies chimpanzees have intelligence just like humans because we use tools too. Why, we should make chimps citizens and acknowledge they have the same rights as human beings. If chimpanzees actually have intelligence like humans, why aren't they de developing better forms of getting ants out of logs? Why, are there why aren't there ant farms? And how long will it be before they put together a space shuttle or at least some form of agriculture? Unless, of course, chimpanzees are wise avoiding such developments because they would, uh, they understand that these developments would be harmful to the environment. Lewis wonders if science will have the discipline to reverse or limit this demystifying of creation and leave room for God. He writes, Perhaps I am asking impossibilities. Perhaps in the nature of things, uh, analytical understanding must always be a basilisk which kills what it sees and only sees by killing. But if the scientists themselves cannot arrest this process before it reaches the common reason the, uh, and kills that too, then someone else must resist it. He, his point is that one of these things that separates humans from animals is the ability to acknowledge and understand the, un, the invisible. Without this ability, isn't man just another mammal further along on the evolutionary road? And at this point, hasn't he achieved the abolition of man. Some society, our society has come to believe that humans are only 
visible creatures living in a visible world. They have no special relationship with the rest of the visible reality, except that maybe they are the chief of parasites, uh, and if they are not arrested and killed, they will become a problem and destroy all of the visible world. In this scenario, the only solution is for human beings to be exterminated. What does the society of man look like once the invisible is gone from common reason and all we have is the visible? Gone will be, the intrin will be intrinsic value and beauty. Gone will be objective right and wrong. Gone will be altruism. Gone will be contentment. Gone will be any love that goes beyond carnal desire gone will be any possibility of a common foundation of morals innovation for good of, for the good of society and innovation for for itself will be replaced by selfish interests only the rest of you be damned the evidence that we have achieved the abolition of man is uh, all around us we see it in the failure of education Lewis demonstrates how this comes about through his analysis of the Little Green Book to teach English. Since the time of, that Lewis wrote, expenditures on education have skyrocketed while the outcome has been in a steady decline uh, in literacy as our society marches rapidly uh, into the dark void of stupidity. In the past, education was a function of passing information from the knowledgeable to those less knowledgeable and developing the student's understanding of what is good based on what has been revealed regarding the invisible. Because the visible has become the sole foundation of education and there is no possibility of the inevitable, psychology, which can only acknowledge the realm of the visible, determines how the process of education is to be conducted. Because of this, the real good of education is now uh, an ambiguous definition, and it is subjective. The goal is happiness. When I was in when I was going through school in the 60s and 70s, I heard the slogan, learning is fundamental. I saw that the goal of the educators was to see to it that the students were having fun. The emotional pleasure of the students was replacing the historic goal of education, of reading, writing, arithmetic, history, proficiency in communication and reasoning. The determining factor for the school's success had become the emotional pleasure of students, and being well adjusted was defined by the psychological norms. I'll give three examples of this playing out. First, in my last parish, the local school had seen the decline in their standard test scores. To get to the bottom of what was going on about this situation, the school board established a committee consisting of parents, teachers, and administrators to make recommendations for reversing the trend. At the completion of the study, I read the, with interest the 12 recommendations. None had anything to do with education. Nothing about moving from whole language back to phonics or spending more time on math tables. Among the recommendations were providing the children with breakfast, separating the disruptive students from the test room, providing a two-week period of teaching the students how to take the test, and reviewing the topics the test writers had included in the test. Second example, when I was headmaster of the congregation school, I learned very quickly that the parents were not interested in having their children educated. They had a very simple standard. Is my child happy? The less homework, the better. The school did not provide a lunch program. Apparently, the days of brown bagging were over. Parents insisted 
uh, in, in, instead sent a variety of microwavable lunches and insisted that the teachers heated up their lunches in the microwave. The teacher had had to man the teachers had to man the microwaves, leaving no time to eat themselves. And by the time all the lunches were heated, the last student didn't have time to eat either. The educational process had been hijacked by the creature comforts of the students. The argument was, it's hard to concentrate if you need a snack. It's important to stay hydrated so that all had water, so all had water bottles, and many of those had flavored sugary drinks. Then they had to go to the bathroom. Rather than focusing on education, teachers were forced to be babysitters. The primary focus and goal of the educational process was to was not learning, reading, writing, arithmetic, math, history, and learning to reason. Rather, the primary focus was the feeling and comfort of the students. If any of the, that other stuff happened, well, then okay. But first, students must be comfortable and happy. So the reality is that the school day is consumed by creature comfort, and reading, writing, etc are never given their due attention. The third example. In confirmation class, I tried to have some of the memory work tested with fill in the blank. I gave printed tests of the commandments, leaving blanks to be filled in. Students and parents complained that I had not provided a word bank, like, like they do in the, in the public school. So the next time, I provided a 15-word word bank to fill in 10 blanks. I was told, that's not fair. In fact, the problem was not the test. The problem was the student had not been uh, taught how to do memory work. The fact is, they're never taught how to do mem memory work because education these days, memory work is considered evil. It's not done. I heard one paper given at a teacher's conference, not a Missouri Senate, but a public school conference, uh, that made the point that memorizing should not be taught and those insisting on requiring memory work were harming the students. What students must learn today is how to use technology to look up and uh, the information that they need. Grades are now no longer verifying uh, a, achievement, but are to affirm at the and give a sense of accomplishment. Whether students have achieved anything is irrelevant. Seeing good grades and giving little egos a boost is the goal. If little Pat can run home with a smiley face sticker, he, she is happy. Mom showers him, her with uh, affirming praise, and dad can put the my child is smarter than your child uh, bumper sticker on his car along the coexist bumper sticker. This is why colleges ha have to add remedial English, math, history, etc., to bring first-year students uh, to the entry level of proficiency. Actually, most colleges are giving up on this and are pushing to drop entrance requirements altogether. The denial of the invisible has led to the, the decimation of the educational system and along with it, the political, judicial, and social systems of the United States. The Declaration of Independence serves by acknowledging the existence of the invisible. We can and do spend much time discussing which God is being referred to as the creator in this document. Were the founding, were the founding fathers Christians or were they deists? While such questions have pretty good recreational value, I don't think they take into account the need of our founding fathers to avoid being distracted. The invisible creator 
is a necessary presupposition for the success of a democratic republic form of government established in the Constitution. The founders, testi the founders testify to the invisible when they assert, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. The assertion that there is a creator and are an established order in creation is the anchor that makes this nation possible and serves like the centerboard of a sailboat, which makes it possible for the vessel to be controlled by the rudder. Without that centerboard, the sailboat is left to the whims of the wind and waves because the invisible centerboard is currently being denied society at every level is left without control or direction be that in family relationships education government and the judiciary all are set adrift man's distinction and superiority over the animals is gone humans are nothing more than animals thus the trousered ape and the abolition of man. I ran out of text. Uh, thank you, Pastor Cleavy. Uh, so now, uh, my question is, is how do we actually, you said we see this in our, in our schools or our homes and our, our churches, et cetera. And it looks like the, the apes are taking their trousers off now. I don't know if you've noticed. So like, how do we get them to put them back on? That's step one. And then like, what do we do? I mean, as pastors, what I see, and I guess I kind of wanted to ask that along the lines of the first article um, of, the, of the creed. Well, first of all, I think it would be a good idea to say start a college somewhere that is uh, committed simply to proper Lutheran theology. And uh, I, I, if anyone hasn't done that, start that now. Um, the, the conclusion, and in those two books I mentioned earlier, the... Uh, uh, serpents in the classroom and such. The conclusion is really the application of actual historic Lutheran theology in education. And that would mean classical ed. Now, the problem is in the bureaucratic organization we call the Missouri Synod, as I said, they have adopted a peaceful relationship with psychology and sociology and all these things. And I have gotten in trouble for years when I say theology is far above psychology, sociology, because all of those things exist in only the visible. We have founded our entire educational pedagogy in the Missouri Senate on the very same thing that they have in the, the world. They've founded it on psychology and sociology and, and all of those kind of things. And the problem is when you do that, you have already started ignoring the invisible the knowledge that comes from God. So what do we do as pastors? One is we got to stop using these freaking stupid things of psychology and sociology. We're going to start a church. You know how we're going to start a church? We're going to meet people's felt needs. Hmm. Has it worked? Has it, I mean, I grew, went through the church growth movement, all based on science. You're going to have the demographics, and you can still go to your district office and ask for the demographics. They'll give you the demographics. Oh, we got a lot of people that like bike riding in our area, so we should start a bike riding ministry. That's organic fertilizer. So what do we do? As individual pastors, as individual pastors, we ourselves have to get over this idea that the world has anything on us. You're far superior to any psychiatrist. I don't care who it is. And even the Christian psychiatrist, you, you, you have 
so much more because you are working with the revealed knowledge of God. He's kind of smart. So that, that's it. The, I, I also liked how you, it's very hard to overcome that disconnect, which you mentioned earlier about, you know, the revealed will of God and natural science. They just simply assume it's there. And in so doing, they insert their own religion, right? Right. But it would seem that two things would need to happen for that to happen, for us to actually fight against it. One is we actually need real scholars who can teach the truth without getting too bogged down in, yeah, in detail. They, they use too many big words. Yeah, right. And the other is to fight. Yeah. And to actually go after these people. Can, can you imagine how exciting it would be to be someone who is a scientist and is discovering things that God is doing? You're, you're directly seeing it. One of my favorite ones, and because of my age, is getting old. Have you heard of the buckyball? You guys need to study more science. The, the buckyball is a carbon molecule that in the olden days, maybe most of you don't remember this, soccer balls used to have little octagonal sections. If you put a carbon atom at the corner of each one of those intersections, you would have the Bucky ball. And it was discovered by a guy named Bucky. And it was discovered in the very rare element called soot. It's been there all along. Science finally had the tools to see what God was doing. If we were able to make a sheet out of that, we would be far better than carbon fiber. It would be... So all those things. Now, as a Christian scientist, you would be singing to dams when you, when you saw that. Man, look at what God is doing. When, when you cut a gem, it looks like a stone, just a hunk of, it looks like maybe glass. But when you finally take the thing off the dob stick the last time, all of that, we'd call it potential, was put there so that you can see the glory that God has put in there. I remember the first gem I cut. My grandfather left me in the basement by myself. I took it off the daub stick, and he had a high-intensity light, and it looked like a doggone, uh, what do you call those, dance balls, uh, disco ball in the basement. All of that beauty was there from creation. God created it to do that for me so that I could see it and have that enjoyment. So as when you, when you say we, we, the basis of science, it doesn't do away with science or scientific thought. It makes it fun. You are discovering things that God is constantly doing. What a joy. So getting back to the foundation of invisible being God, as they confessed in the Nicene Creed, opens up for the engineer and the artist and, and for, for people a joy that has been cut off for, from them. Thanks, Pastor, for your uh, presentation. Um, and it, it was, that was very scholarly, I thought. Um, some good, good thoughts. Rob, uh, can you talk to him? <laughs> he, he's, uh, as, as, um, as 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 Cat Stevens says, from the moment I could talk, I was ordered to listen. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about the invisible, it you know it sounds like you're 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 talking about hope, the hope that we have. You know, you hope in what you do not see, and that this trousered ape, this abolition of man, is just a hopelessness. And I and and particularly what I was interested in is you talking about the the lack of memorizing and the, the 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 negligence of that and the unwillingness to do that and that you're connecting that to not having that that belief in the invisible or uh, that and so that hopelessness is it's like a cynicism and so obviously you know we have different strategies i've used different strategies we could talk about that kind of stuff on how to get kids to memorize and how to get how to teach them how to do it since they don't really know 
um, it seems. But what I want to ask from you is how can we explain, particularly to our catechism students, and but in general to, to everyone, uh, how the hope that we have in Christ, whom we do not see, yet we love, we believe in, um, that that, that, that uh, uh, should, should give us all the ground and reason to do that rudimentary, you know, seemingly boring work of memorizing. Why, why do you grow apple trees? For the, for the apples, for the fruit. Do you force the trees to grow the apples? No, you plant them. The apples just happen. Hope, and all that that brings with us in faith, is a byproduct of the existence of the invisible, where there is that understanding of who God is and what he has revealed to ourselves. That gives the underpinning of the hope. And I'm not talking the emotional hope, but the reality that there is a God. Uh, so you start there with the parents, because if you're doing a confirmation class, class, you lose, except on the very rare occasion. Uh, the problem is the parents and how the children have been raised. You, you, can, you can take the kindergarten in your, your Sunday school and get them all to do memory work, and it ain't going to work unless it is part and parcel of the home and what the parents do and what they say, that they also have that understanding of this which we are talking about, which you cannot see, is really important. And they show that. They don't tell that. And so until we first address that, uh, you know, good, good luck in confirmation class. That's one of the things I do not and will never miss. <laughs> Sorry, I know we're supposed to love teaching youth. As, as Lewis put it, I do not appreciate the society of children. I, I, I know that's a flaw in myself. And I know that because of the revealed knowledge. But I still do not appreciate the... And the biggest reason is because the raw materials to work with in confirmation class have been so destroyed. I'm not talking about the curriculum. I'm talking about the kids. By the time you get them in confirmation, they don't give a rat's tail. They're there for one reason, because the parents are making them. Yeah. And if they get through, oh, man, uh, boy, it has to be 30 years ago. I, pull, I dropped a nuclear bomb of pastoral practice. Out of a class of 13, I confirmed three. <laughs> Nobody noticed. I was expecting that when I came into the office the next day, there are going to be two lines. One is we got to get this bastard out of here for not confirming our kids. And the other group would have been like you guys saying, well, it's about time someone took a stand. But there was nothing. They honestly didn't care. That goes back to the, not to the educational process. and to, uh, No, that goes back to they don't believe there's a true God. Faith. All right, we have time for one more question. Actually, you have time for one more answer. <laughs> I also had an aunt that gave me pajamas for Christmas, and we have an annual picture of us lined up to send it to her in the mail. Um, but it was a very perceptive observation that you made about the giving of gift receipts and the uh, egocentricity of not only our giving, but also our receiving. Um, could you give us a tip or two how to push back against that? Well, it goes back to where the hope comes from. That goes back to the parenting. That goes, uh, but see, see, if you take that section out and try to deal with it in isolation, you lose. Because the foundation, it's not a matter of we're doing it wrong. It's a matter that we don't have the right foundation, invisible and invisible. And if we start there, then as our Father gives us gifts that we don't know where they came from or why, and a lot of his gifts I don't like at the time, <laughs> but he's giving them because he loves me. 
and I can understand that love if I am brought up in that first article faith and understand. So you, you live that in the home. And you also uh, don't give into the giving of gift cards. It's easy. Give actual gifts. And if they don't like it, tough organic fertilizer. The, 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 the reason that you are giving a gift is to express your love and joy for them. Now, don't be a jerk like me and give them stupid gifts, but because they are the object of your love, you will seek to give them a gift that may leave them wondering why you gave it to them. So it's in, in all of these practices, uh, but they all go back to that, that invisible, the understanding and acknowledging and it being there. So... Okay. All right, let's give one more round of applause for Pastor Cleby.